this time we step into that message and scripture portion of our service. And as Megan alluded to in our introduction, we're kind of getting out of the series we were just in called Home is Where the Heart Is, starting this new series, which is really the old series of going through the history of the people of Israel. So there's going to be a lot of remembering this morning as I ask you to remember back to what we talked about a month ago when the people of Israel were in exile. And we heard that story of Daniel, and some of you might remember the story of Daniel. He had the choice between the bacon and steak that the king was eating or the Brussels sprouts and river water that he was going to eat. And he decided rather than fitting in and eating the king's meal, he was going to be a weirdo in a weird place and eat his Brussels sprouts and asparagus. But he was going to do it to be faithful to God. You see, Daniel's priority was to follow God's law. Daniel, through his life up to this point, before our message today, lived his life being faithful to God and also being opportunistic, which for Daniel means he made the most of the opportunities he had to serve the people around him. And now he's got another message to share with us today. So let's hear our video and see what Daniel's story has to teach us. King Belshazzar, the ruler of Babylon, had a big feast. A thousand guests came to eat and drink with the king. During the party, King Belshazzar brought out gold and silver containers for his guests to drink from. The containers had been taken from God's temple in Jerusalem. The king was misusing them. While the king and his guests drank, they worshipped their false gods, gods made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly the feast was interrupted. A hand appeared at the wall and its fingers began writing a message. The king watched the hand, and he was very afraid. His face was pale and his legs shook. The king stared at the message on the wall, but he didn't understand what it meant. The king called for the wise men in his kingdom. If anyone can tell me what this message means, I will give him gifts and an important job in my kingdom, he said. The wise men came, but none of them knew what the message meant. King Belshazzar and his guests were upset. Then the queen remembered Daniel. Daniel was wise, so Daniel was called to the palace. Daniel saw the message and understood what it meant. The message was from God. Daniel reminded the king about what happened to his relative, King Nebuchadnezzar. God made King Nebuchadnezzar great, Daniel said. But King Nebuchadnezzar thought too much of himself, so God punished him. King Belshazzar had not learned from Nebuchadnezzar's mistakes. King Belshazzar did not love God. He loved himself the most, and he worshipped false gods. Then Daniel read the message aloud and told the king what the words meant. The words on the wall were mene, tekel, and Parson. Mene meant that God had counted the days of the kingdom. The king wasn't going to be king anymore. The next word, Tekel, meant that God had given the king a report card, and he had failed. The word Parson meant that Babylon would be split up and taken over by its enemies. That night, God's message came true. King Belshazzar was killed, and a new king named Darius took over Babylon. God humbled the proud king of Babylon by taking away his kingdom. King Jesus willingly humbled himself by dying on the cross for our sin. God raised up Jesus and gave him honor forever. When we humble ourselves and trust in Jesus, God will raise us up to enjoy Jesus in his kingdom forever. So Daniel was faithful and opportunistic. 
Daniel is one of the masters of conversion in the Old Testament. And this story of Daniel and King Belshazzar, Belshazzar is the only king that Daniel did not convert to the one true faith and the one true God. His father, Nebuchadnezzar, came to believe in the one true God. The king after Belshazzar came to believe in the one true God because Daniel was faithful and opportunistic to deliver God's word. And that word that God sent to King Belshazzar wasn't a great word. Have any of you, how many of you have ever heard the phrase, read the writing on the wall? Okay, most of, most of the adults have heard that phrase. If you've heard that phrase, that actually comes from this story. This is the writing on the wall, right? That human hand comes and writes on the wall. And that's not just me. Even Google confirms that. The writing on the wall isn't good news. It's not good news whenever you hear that phrase. And it's certainly not good news for King Belshazzar. The writing on the wall says, Mene, Mene, your days have been counted and they've come to an end. It says, Tekel, you, you get your report card and it shows that according to God's holiness, you're not good enough. And Parson, you're not going to be king anymore, but somebody else is going to be king. For Belshazzar, that news was really, really scary. When Daniel read to him the writing on the wall, he was terrified. And I know that we all kind of know the writing on the wall. I don't know what brought you here, but I imagine that one of the reasons you are here today is because you've read the writing on the wall. And you don't need to come here to hear about it, to hear the fact that your days are numbered because the world is really good at reminding us of that, of how fragile our lives are and how at any moment they could be taken. Or, or to be reminded that when we get our report card from a holy, perfect God, we aren't good enough. And we are deserving of judgment. That's what the word tekel means. Or even though we try to organize our lives, even though we try to control things, even though we try to get a handle on what our family's doing and get a mastery over our lives and what happens, Parson, we aren't the kings of our lives. We aren't the queens of our lives. And we know that there are things that are out of our control. You've heard the writing on the wall. And I imagine that the writing on the wall, the words of God, remind us to come here and hear a better writing. You see, the writing on the wall for us, for King Belshazzar, that was the last word he had from God. But for us, we get to hear another word from God. And it's not just the writing on the wall, but the writing on the cross. Right? That's what Christmas is about. It's about God sending his son Jesus into our world so that he can take on the sins of the world. And as Jesus, the word of God, not in just a human hand, but in a human body, walks on this earth, they hang him up on the cross. And in Jesus, the writing on the cross, we hear these words a different way. Many, many, your days are numbered, but they meet their end on the cross of Christ. Tekel, your report card isn't good enough, but your punishment is there on the cross of Christ as the word of God hangs there. Parson, you aren't the king of your world, but just read the inscription above the cross of Christ. This is the king of the Jews, and that writing on the cross is writing for us too, as Jesus isn't only the king of the Jews, but he is our king too. God uses the cross, the writing on the cross as his divine eraser to erase the writing on the wall for us. And how does he do that? Well, we saw a little piece of it again today. 
See, as Jackson and Harper are baptized into the family of God, they're baptized into the community of St. Luke's. One of Jesus' friends, Paul, reminds us that they're also actually baptized into the death of Christ. So that through baptism, our our lives are united to Christ's life. So that when we talk about death, we're actually talking about what happened on the cross of Christ where we were judged with all of our sins. So that in baptism, we can be raised to new life. And in baptism, God keeps writing. He takes out his book of life that has in it all of the names of those people who believed in Jesus. And today he writes Jackson and Harper. And he's written your name there in the book of life too. As we think about the writing, there are are those three writings that matter to us. The writing on the wall that reminds us we need Jesus. The writing on the cross that shows us that God gives himself fully to us. And then the writing in the book that reminds us that we are members of his kingdom. You see, but God doesn't just write his name in that, write our names in the book of life so that we can live life and feel good about ourselves. But he writes our names in the book of life so that like Daniel, we would go live our lives faithful to God's word, and being opportunistic to serve our neighbors. One of the ways that I have been reflecting on this this week is I realized as I was leafing through my prayer journal that I've lived in my neighborhood for a little over two months now, and I hadn't yet sat down and prayed for the salvation of my neighbors, of the people living around me. And in preparation for this sermon, that's something I wrote in my prayer journal, to keep them in mind, to keep being opportunistic, to see the ways that God is calling me to show love for the neighbors around me. You see, because God writes your name in the book of life. He gives you the gift of his son for eternity so that you can share that gift with the people that you interact with every single day. Your name is written in the book of life. The writing on the wall doesn't apply to you anymore. So let's spend our lives faithfully and opportunistically showing others the writing on the cross, God's divine eraser. Amen.